um, hand it over to our next speaker, uh, Jing, who's going to talk some of, about some of the hardware work. So, Jing. Thanks, Lucky Park. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jing Wang. Um, I'm from Unreal. Um, first of all, uh, thanks, uh, Julia, inviting me for the uh, panel to present our work for the uh, Unify project we did. So um, we did a test uh, seven grid form inverters from five vendors from small scale, like a few kilowatt to a few hundred kilowatt, uh, five uh, well, grid form inverter from five vendors. We aim to explore the grid form inverter interoperability through hardware testing. So this is under the Unify one megawatt demo. Um, I think everyone knows already about the uh, what is Unify. So I'm not going to emphasize that uh, project. Um, I will start from the background why we want to do this uh, um, multi inverter testing. First of all, as for today, there are so many good form inverter testing protocol, but there's all for simulation. You, you can name uh, the one from UK, the one from AMO, Fingrid, and there are many others. Look as also. Uh, uh, testing protocol for grid form inverter as well. But uh, all those are sim for simulation. And there's no single testing protocol for hardware. So that means there's a um, gap there. That's why we want to develop the comprehensive and the standard strict uh, testing protocol for grid form inverter to address this gap. And uh, additionally, we want to um, promote a compliance test. Let's say if we have more grid forming water to be tested, what are the functionalities they need to pass X, Y, Z? So this is one of the reasons we want to do this test. Another one is uh, like uh, Deepak said, every grid, every water is different, no matter it's grid forming or grid following. So we want to understand those uh, difference between them and the nodes, how to harmonize the difference and understand the interoperability that is actually dispatchability and the functionality. So from a system operator perspective, how to dispatch and control them and harmonize them to improve the stability of future grid. And uh, on the other hand, we also want to use this uh, interoperability study to drive the unified one uh, unified grid form specification. So this is another uh, motivation behind this work. Lastly, we want to share our findings and learning with broader audience. For example, for utilities, how to configure and control grid form inverters. And for in vendor, what are the grid form inverter specifications? And for academia, what are the research gaps that they can work on to improve this technology? Overall, we illustrate the interoperability of grid form inverter through working at multiple grid form inverters. So this is the overall objective of the uh, one megawatt demo, multi window grid form inverter testing. Um, in the next slide, I will give you an overview of our test plan. So our test uh, started last year. We test the five grid form inverter. We start from unit testing, and this is the test plan we have. We have a standalone test, uh, including the steady state test, uh, transient test, with all different uh, tests you can say, see here. And we have also heterogeneous operation parallels with diesel, because this is something we want to understand. Uh, because in the future grid, diesel single machine will not go away. So when we have grid forming world parallel with legacy diesel or single machine, how how they share the power, how they respond differently, and how they should co uh, correlate together. And uh, we also have grid connected operation. So this is one of the uh, collection studies that industry want to see because they say, well, the standalone test uh, in the genius operation, we already understood from micro operations for many years. But uh, how does grid forming world behave when they connect to the grid? So we did a lot of grid connect tests. First, uh, we want to explore how we control the grid forming inverter, like grid following inverter, dispatch them to output the target power. Additionally, how the grid forming inverter can maintain the system stability, particularly for frequency response for voltage, uh, uh, voltage regulation. And uh, a lot of other tests like a uh, um, LVRT test, uh, Rokov, and uh, also the phase jump. And uh, we also did the frequency scan to understand the um, inherent feature of all these grid form inverters. And we also did the um, varying the grid impedance to see changing from the strong grid to the weak grid, how grid forming inverter exactly behave better than the grid following. So all those tests we have done. And we also did the last test, which is uh, transition operation. This is my grid application. So we start from the as landed mode and then we synchronize to the grid, then we go to 
as learning mode again. So those are the high level view of uh, the tests we have done. Very comprehensive, very standard and strict process. When it, we also have the standard uh, performance metrics, how to evaluate each of the inverter. Uh, as for today, we have done all this uh, unit testing. We also collect them together, did a section testing. We have also, now we are enter the phase, the final phase, we connect them together and um, to see how we can uh, integrate them together, dispatch them, and then um, operate the future scenario like a 100% renewable case with mixed uh, grid forming, grid following, and then these as a standby. So this is overview of the test. Uh, for today's talk, I'm going to show you the results we have obtained from the unit testing. Yeah. Um, so here, this is the table list uh, the inverter specification for the five grid form inverters. And uh, every inverter is different. And how to harmonize them together is JUP, right? JUP is like English. Everyone has their own language. Now we use English to communicate with each other. This is, we did the same thing. So the original group definition for every inverter is different. I can give you one example. So of grid forming one, it says 0.25% group. So this is the standard way to define group in percent, right? But for grid forming two, it tells you something really un hard to understand. 0.1 hertz give 7.8 kilowatt at 500. What is this? Have anyone heard about this way to define group? No, right? And then the third one, 0.5 hertz. The last one saying the tube gain is 50. And then grid forming five says, no, you don't know. You, co you can only work in ISOC mode. So every grid forming inverter is different. And then after translating them, like we have translated into English. So we did the frequent tube translation. So the second row, you can see what is the tube percentage each inverter has. And uh, mention, I want to mention the grid forming four has the uh, virtual impedance control that somehow shift the group. So by the default, it should be 0.83%, but actually it's 0.35%. I will show later um, what we find out. And then similarly, for voltage group, it has a different language, then we need to translate it into the same language, and then we find out how much group they really use. And then we also need to check if the inverter has single check capability. Uh, so five inverter out of four, they have the single chain capability. And the grid forming two does not have, and then we have to use a SCS7451 uh, single chain relay to close to the um, breaker and synchronize to the external system. And for the second control, all the inverter has second control. And the operation mode, they all have the uh, uh, grid following control in the grid connected, but for this particular test, we configure them all working grid forming control, even if it's grid connected. And for communication, they still lay behind. They don't use 2030.5, they are still using legacy communications. So this is the overview in spe inverter specification. Yeah. Um, in the next slide, I want to show you the testing circuit because we are somehow doing the standard uh, um, Benchmark testing, we want to use the same, we also compare the performance between inverters. So we need to use the same circuit. So this diagram shows you what is the common circuit we use to test the each individual uh, inverter. We have grid simulator, we have the micro switch, we have the uh, grid falling inverter parallel as well. We have the synchronous machine, we have a uh, uh, resistive or, or linear load, we have low linear load, we have also induction mode as a, um, to provide in, that, uh, in rush current to test the grid forming water capability. Yeah, so this is overall uh, testing circuit. We mainly focus on the power quality, overloading capability and the transient stability. So this is the uh, testing circuit. Um, then for our testing, we actually use the same tube for all the inverters, because if we want to compare, we need to start from the same base, right? Uh, we, for the frequency tube, we use 0.6%. For the voltage, we use 5%. The reason we use those uh, values, because they uh, is also the discussion with the vendors. They say those are the values are tend to work better for the distribution and the micro scenarios. I know some inverter, grid form inverter use much higher droop uh, than what we use. Um, so the first step we did is characterize droop because droop is a common language and we need to know uh, what exactly droop they have. So we test all the inverter under different loading situation from 5%, turn and up to 100. And then we draw the curve and see what is the exact droop. All the uh, grid forming one, two, three, they 
have the same dupe as uh, the uh, default value based on the experiment data, but grid forming four has a uh, lower dupe because of the um, water impedance control, and uh, because it's a linear relation, so it's easy to find what is the exact dupe. It's actually using 0.35%. And with this way, we know if we want to achieve 0.6%, how we can tune the dupe game to reach that value. So that's a problem is solved. But uh, what I want to mention is uh, for people who commission inverter, well, the first step you should do is really understand your dupe. It may not be the same as the default value from from the settings. And secondly, you also need to characterize a, a voltage group. Uh, for all the inverter we are testing, we have the delta Y transformer, delta face the inverter side, and we measure at the Y side. So because of the transformer, the voltage has a drop. So back, basically that uh, shifts your tube. If it's uh, injecting power, the tube is down. For uh, absorbing power, the tube is up. So we also characterize that because this is a, uh, where we stand to start from, because a lot of later tests based on the clearly understanding of the exact tube. So that's what we did. So this is where we start characterize tube, make sure you have the clear idea what is the tube values, what is the intercept, what is the um, what is the uh, tube slope. And based on that preparation work, we move to the first test, the black start. Because the uh, black start is uh, one of the most important function that we use it. Uh, so based on all the, we have the same protocol for all the five inverters. So from the table, I will not go through all of them. Uh, you can see we all the grid form inverter pass the black start. They can reach the full voltage within less than 0.1 hertz, less uh, around six uh, cycles. But uh, only grid forming one does not have the soft black star all the other inverter has. So, uh, so this is what we find out. I think uh, we went we went back to the um, inverter vendor. They will improve their black star capability. Yeah. So this is the first feature uh, for the, today's presentation. I only showed very limited results just to show you what we have achieved. But uh, in the future, we will publish our report, and the more results will come. Um, and then uh, for the Good for me, voter uh, interoperability. How we dispatch them is a very important topic, right? So what we did is uh, we want to dispatch grid forming water like grid following water. So for grid connected operation mode, how we dispatch grid forming water like grid following. So what we did is uh, uh, we, we did some study. So uh, if there's no, so if we don't do anything for the tube, so the grid forming water has the same um, frequency as the um, grid when it connects. So you can see uh, it lands in the um, point in the first uh, scenario. So there's no power exchange between grid following device and, and the device under the grid. But if we want a grid forming water to inject power, so we shift the inverter tube of the grid forming water up, then automatically the power will go from the uh, inverter to the grid. Similarly, for the third scenario, if we want the grid forming water to absorb uh, power, then we shift the tube down, so it will automatically absorb power from the grid. Very simple game and the dispatch rule is shown on the bottom. So uh, the delta F is a uh, shifting uh, room, how much you want to, uh, your inverter generate, then you, how much you shift based on that delta F. Delta F equal M times P times 60. M is your tube slope, P is your power in per unit and then times 60. So that's the frequency it will go uh, up or down based on the target. And we can apply the same rule as uh, reactive power. Uh, output, but it's a little bit complicated. I will show you later. Yeah, and uh, for the Atlantic operation, for Atlantic operation, everyone think, yeah, uh, everyone will use tube to do the power sharing, right? This is the uh, old school we learned. But uh, grid forming in Atlantic mode can also be dispatched like a grid following water. How we do that? Um, it still play with tube. Um, as you can see here, I will not go through the uh, um, principles how to move from one point to the next, but uh, generic speaking, if you have a target power for your grid forming water, let's say your battery SOC is low, I want to charge, so I want to charge certain power. So you have that target power and you have all the um, set points. So the delta F, that's the room you shift up and down, so you can calculate based on the uh, dispatch rule here. Very simple and very effective. So that's uh, the operation uh, interoperability for grid forming water in Atlantic mode to dispatch them to output the target power. You can do this game for all the inverter you want out, then output to the specific target power. So this is what we play. And uh, 
the next slide shows you the, it, okay, in the grid connected mode, how we dispatch the grid forming water. You can see this is a change in the power or the grid forming water output the target power. And the, for the as landing mode, we start from the uh, equal power sharing. We have one inverter we wanted to charge with a certain uh, power. This is so based on the dispatch rule. This is also achieved. So this re results validate the dispatch ability or interoperability of grid forming motors. And next, uh, I want to show the Rockoff. Rockoff is one of the tests that most utility want us to test. So for the we use a one hertz per second change uh, of the frequency. And for all these five tests, all the inverter failed. And uh, we, when we look underneath why this failed, we find out when the, there's a rock off um, happens in the grid, there's an instantaneous moment, the energy is imbalanced between the DC and the AC side. And uh, actually the DC side energy is not enough. So that's why we keep increasing the DC. Originally we put 1.08 uh, PU, now we increase to 1.2, and then we increase to 1.5. It is still not correct. But later we realized, yeah, 0.6 percent joule does not allow you go to one hertz per second. So we have to uh, increase the joule slope to make sure it can go to the one hertz drop or up. And then we finally make the beautiful rock of test work. So even you, with 1.2 PU, yeah. So um, this is how we troubleshooting the inverter make the rock of work. The takeaway is if we want to do a good rock of uh, test, you need to have uh, correct uh, tube settings, you need to have proper uh, uh, enough sizing for your DC. So this is what we find out. Um, and then we did also secondary control uh, for frequency. For frequency, we have the similar rule. We measure the active power and then we dispatch the delta F to shift the uh, frequency of each inverter. Eventually, they reach the target 60 hertz because that's a goal. And for the reactive power, we have the similar dispatch rule. We work on uh, another, we work on the um, voltage uh, intercept shift up and down. And uh, the EI is the jupe intercept uh, shift up and down. So that's calculated based on the reactive power. We use the uh, average reactive power as a target and then all the individual inverter will uh, uh, have a PI controller to look at that target. We eventually, we have, um, we start with unequal power sharing, then we have the equal sharing. This is a very practical, very effective. So this is another way we explore the interoperability of grid form inverter. And uh, this picture shows you the lab setup. As for today, we have uh, tested all the individual tests and we completed all the section tests when we uh, pack a few inverters together. And now we are enter the final phase to test them all together. And we have already seen the oscillation between sections. And that's a very interesting uh, thing we are going to uh, study in the research. And uh, overall, um, a few key uh, takeaways for the audience here. For the, if you are commissioning grid form inverter, understand the frequency and the voltage tube is very important. Secondly, if you tune the tube slope on the fly, that will cause a lot of stability issue. So we try to avoid that. Third, uh, uh, Grid forming water can be dispatched like a grid falling water, uh, uh, all are through the droop intercept. So those are the dispatch rule or interability rule. And the reactive power should be properly man managed, otherwise there will be a lot of issues there. And the, also it will derate your uh, inverter. So you want your inverter to output more active power, but your reactive power go unexpected. So it will, you will have no more room. And uh, finally, grid forming water has similar output impedance. It indeed shows better stability in than grid falling water. I didn't have slides, but uh, in the future meetings, I will show uh, how grid forming water really behave better than grid following. And uh, overall, uh, I want to mention interoperability of grid forming water is all about droop. Uh, if you manage your droop well, you manage the grid forming water dispatch dispatchability, stability, damping control, and many others. So this is a, a very important lesson we learned from all this uh, multi inverter testing. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jing. Any quick questions? Thank you so much, Jing. I have two questions. One log logistical one. I know and in Unify there is this uh, testing specification that have been written. So I'm wondering how this work kind of feeds into that. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So uh, 
we are trying to hit the last milestone for CETO. After that, we will particularly uh, take out the unify specification and then use our test to verify. We verify this specification, verify that specification. And something that we haven't done, we will do it uh, particularly. So that's uh, probably we'll start next year, February time. And that's Ben's ask uh, to do that, yeah. Yeah. Right. And and another question, you mentioned that the DC site uh, capacity is important. So I was wondering on the tests you've made, uh, would it be possible based on specific country specification or say unify specification, kind of figure out what kind of DC site capacity you need for a given specification to be able to pass? Yes, that's one thing we are thinking as well. For example, for roll calls, we have step down, step up, and see what is the room, uh, what is the range that the emoter uh, can pass the um, Rokov test. But uh, we don't know if that can be generic requirement for uh, standardization or specification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, every emoter is different. But uh, at least we have some uh, experience. We say, oh, with this value, you should be able to pass. So that's mm -hmm. what we can suggest, but we cannot drive any specification, yeah. Yeah, kind of general guideline, right? Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I'm Sushabhan from Johns Hopkins University. I have two questions. Uh, in the testing circuit that you've shown- Only, only one question. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah. So in the in the testing circuit that you've shown, is there any specific reason of using a battery for GFM and a source for GFL? Um, you mean the DC source? Yeah, in the testing circuit. So for the grid forming, there was a battery connected to that. So instead of battery can, I mean, what was the reason for using a battery there? Batteries, uh, we have one project, we use PV as a primary source. That's not a very stable. And then we have to use all the battery. And another reason because uh, PV is single uh, flow of power, but and for all the tests, we need to buy direction. That's why we choose battery. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jing. So, call upon our next speaker, Ignatio, to talk a little bit about specific aspects related to wind. All right, perfect, thank you. Uh, so yeah, hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, before I start, I suggest uh, everyone go back to Waze uh, PDF and look at the bottom for the patent that Einar and Rob America did. Look at the date, 1996. Like we've been talking about this for, for a while, so it's it's not really like a, a new subject. Um, but we're gonna be talking here about like this implementation in, in grid forming wind, um, specifically for, for DFIG. Um, so as, as a summary, we want to just talk a, a little bit about the, the approach and where we are in prototype testing for a, a grid forming DFIG like product that it's hopefully coming in, in the next few years. Uh, what is the expected grid forming response of these different wind turbines, and then have a little discussion of the inertia and the inertial capability, and and we'll get into the details of why we think that has to be um, discussed in a lot more more detail. Uh, the timer didn't move, so oh, okay, no worries. Uh, so first, like let's discuss what we mean when we're talking about the prototype. So GE has been working over the last few years on a standard 2.8, like this is one of our workhorse uh, wind turbines. Uh, and we've started implementing on top of that uh, our prototype grid forming controls. This uh, picture that we have here is for the prototype that we have in Lubbock, Texas. So that is connected to the local grid. So it's not connected to a grid emulator or it's not run just in a lab. It's an actual wind turbine that's running that can be turned into grid, form, uh, grid forming mode. And then on the bottom, we have a little summary of some of the steps that have been necessary over the last three years to, to get to this point. So the proto like the prototype controls, we first have to design them, think of what is a core control, how to manage uh, energy, how to manage power, how to manage controls. Uh, we go through that, we get a check, we start going through the rigorous simulation validation platforms. If anyone here has worked with GE, you know that we have a lot of in-house simulations. We use also external simulation tools, and we just combine everything together and make sure that no matter what we throw at it, this turbine and these controls are behaving as expected. We do the electrical subsystem testing that is running in a lab. We remove the mechanical part and we just bring like the down tower assembly into a lab. We start testing it and we make sure that that's matching our simulations. 
uh, then we start going to regression testing. That's where we start connecting the load, the mechanical loading, the turbine, and then we start interacting with the load seam and make sure that everything is working as intended. There's no additional uh, stresses in the torque. There's no, nothing weird going on. After that is all done, we create a test plan and we bring the test plan for review the engineering leadership. So this is uh, going to a lot of details, but we just want to make sure that we are trying to dot all of our I's, cross all of our T's. We're going at this very rigorously. So these products, we are trying to not have any hidden obstacles or any uh, challenges once we start deploying this. So some results uh, at, at the top, just the same as, as the previous slide. Just want to highlight that this is actual results uh, as measured from the prototype site. So this is a Rokoff test. So you can see that it's the turbine is running at around one per unit power. That means there's enough wind and it's dispatched to run at full power. And then we add a Rokoff signal. This is an artificial frequency that we add. Given that we're connected to the grid, we cannot bring the frequency down. But what we did is by simulation, we figure out where we could input a signal to emulate a Rokoff. And then we compare that in our detailed simulations against what we simulate a, a Rokoff in the physical frequency. And we, we found exactly where we needed to put all the test signals to get like the right response. So we then do that in the prototype. And we show that in, in this prototype testing, we have like extremely fast, like it's immediate uh, Rokoff response, which is one of the features that we are trying to say that grid forming should have. Uh, then the frequency remains low for the duration of this test. You see it stays low for about 20 seconds. Uh, and we are able to actually provide some overload capacity. This is uh, specifically to, to the DFIG. Um, as you know, the DFIG is not um, power electronics constrained. So we are able to have some long-term overload capacity, not infinite. 10% is, is probably pushing it, but it, it's somewhere in that range. So we are able to stay at high power even uh, for 20, 25, 30, 30 seconds. Um, eventually for this test, we do the inverse rock off, the power goes down, and then the turbine goes back into um, normal operation. This is just one of the tests that we've done. Um, so for the for the site, for the prototype site, we also do all the standard power ramp up, power ramp down, uh, change in dispatch. So it, it's, it's all that, but those are not as interesting. We do phase jumps. We want to make sure that it's going the right phase jump uh, direction, the right amplitude. Uh, and we also want to make sure that for all this test, the interaction between the mechanical system and the contr uh, control system, there, there's no weird interaction there. I, I think that's important to mention because specifically for a wind turbine, you have three separate systems all interacting with each other. Like a wind plant farm, it's not just one turbine. You often have dozens or hundreds. So you need to have first a plant level control that's coordinating all of them, reaching like the right operating condition and sending the right signals. Each turbine then needs to have its own turbine controller. So it's measuring the wind, it's looking at its own stress on the coupling, it's uh, trying to regulate its speed. And then you have the controls on the electrical side, on the converter side, which is trying to grab whatever are the commands coming in from those higher level units and then translating them into voltage and current at the IBR side. So it's, it's important to think of all those because you can start seeing a lot of places where the systems can interact and start actually kind of fighting the grid forming response. Like you could have a an event where the controller, the electrical controller will try to boost the power very fast, but then the mechanical side will be like, oh, well, we don't like that boost. Let's start pushing back. And you start having some interaction in which the two start going back, uh, back and forth against each other. So this requires a lot of like smart coordination between all the parts so we can get a, a response like that. Now we are looking next into some simulation um, results. For this one, we go back to simulation uh, because we want to compare three different subsystems. So uh, I'll just describe them quickly. In black, we have the representation of, let's say a synchronous machine. It's modeled by a swing equation with a few extra blocks. We don't, it's nothing complicated, but it, it gets us most of the way there for a synchronous machine. In blue is our uh, grid forming model, and this is a grid forming wind. And then in red is, let's say, a state of the art grid following wind. Now we are using these uh, simulations to start testing what we're coming up as our grid strengthening metrics. Um, we are a GE working with a few people here uh, on a demonstration project in the West Coast. And as part of that demonstration project, 
uh, we've been developing metrics of what a grid forming uh, resource should be doing. Uh, and those metrics actually can be kind of, kind of hard to coordinate between everybody. So everyone's happy with, with like wording on the metric. But two of the metrics that we are particularly happy with, with the consensus that we've reached are the voltage angle strengthening and voltage magnitude strengthening um, measurements or performance metrics for grid forming. So that is in general that as, as Wei was, was showing, grid forming devices are really a voltage source, be physical or virtual source behind an impedance, be physical, virtual, or combination of both. Our metric of grid strengthening for both angle and magnitude is when that internal phaser remains mostly fixed soon after an event. So what does that mean? That means that when we change the phase or we change the frequency of the grid, that internal voltage magnitude does not move a lot. And that's what gives us and creates the change in power or the change in reactive. So based on that, we have two different definitions. We have the grid angle, which means that the angle will not move much, and the magnitude, which means that the magnitude will not move much. So on the bottom, using that, uh, having that background in mind, you can see the difference in the response of black and red, or black and blue, which are the two, let's say, grid forming devices, to red, which is a grid following device, to a change in frequency. Right? So the, the grid following device, unless it has a way to measure the frequency and decide to change its own dispatch, it will not react to a change in frequency. The PLL will just keep tracking the new frequency. It will adjust to it. The commands will stay fixed to what they are, and the power will remain mostly flat. Of course, this is not what we want for grid forming. So you can see that in this case, the grid forming turbine is behaving roughly as a synchronous machine with an inertia of three seconds and a reactance of about 30% in per unit. Now we go back to the phase jump. This is a negative phase jump. So when you do negative phase jump, your re desire is to get a positive boost in active power. It's interesting, and we, we've been um, get constantly surprised in, in this project. So the grid following device still has a little bit of a phase response. And that is mostly because the PLL still, get, still gets perturbed. So even though you would not necessarily expect, expect that there's an instantaneous error in the PLL, so you do have a little bit of, let's say, phase uh, strengthening uh, movement, active power. However, it's not nearly as big, or the duration is not nearly as long as for the phase jump. So if you grab both of these uh, plots, and let's say you integrate the area below the curve, so the difference between the initial steady state and the active power that you provide, you integrate that, you would see that the uh, grid falling cases are either zero or very low. And you would see that there's a lot of extra, extra energy that's being provided by the grid forming uh, resources, both uh, synchronous machine and grid forming wind turbine, which uh, we're really happy with. Now, we've been discussing inertia. I uh, just mentioned inertia in the previous slide. And it's hard to really define what is inertia. Like how long should you be able to provide this inertia? How do you measure it? Under what events you measure it? So we, we've been coming up with this idea that we should have a test bed in which we can measure inertia of, of different devices. We have two components that we want to be able to separate. One is a phase jump response that I was showing in the previous uh, slide. We don't want the test that we do to show inertia or show positive uh, active power movement for things that are not really inertia. So if you do a phase jump, you would see active power change, and but that's not really inertia. That's not what, really what we're talking about. The second is a very slow controls. So if we do a test in which we measure the change in active power over a few seconds, you might start seeing the plan control, or you might see the plate, blade pitch angle start to act, and it might give you a fake idea of how much inertia your device has. So based on that, we came up with uh, this, um, admittedly a little bit hand wavy, but we think it's useful uh, test bed, in which we apply a three hertz plus minus uh, hertz per second Rokoff with a strong grid, uh, SCR of 20 or higher. We measure the inertia after the first 500 milliseconds. And then we keep the Rokoff on going until we start running into what we think are the equipment limits. The reason we decided uh, 500 milliseconds is because we started comparing the response uh, on this plots. This is for a synchronous machine with droop control and no frequency droop control. And we saw that in the first 500 mil uh, milliseconds, the response of both are roughly the same. But after 500 milliseconds, the frequency droop starts coming in and starts bringing um, the, the simulation with a no droop down and boosting the one with the droop. So we're trying to find what was the right time where we did not have to worry about those plant droop effects. Uh, 
So in the next slide, I'm going to be showing a, a figure of what we've come up to be the inertia contribution of a dfig. Now this this figure has a lot, but let, let's let's break it down into into its small parts. On the y-axis, we have the change in power after the Rokoff event that I described in the in the previous slide, and then on the x-axis we have the initial power that is like the power dispatch that the turbine was running before we did the event. We've roughly identified four different sections, which I'll I'll discuss uh, discuss later. But first, let's disclose that this does not represent a specific product or configuration. This is not what the GE turbine can do, and this is not a specific configuration or sub-configuration of the GE turbine. This is more a thought experiment that should, in theory, roughly apply to all DFIC turbines. Okay, so now let's break it down into the four uh, sections. On the top left, you have what we call the pitch limit or underspeed region. So your turbine is running at low power, uh, let's say 25% or less, which means that your wind speed, or like actually your rotational speed, is going to be in the order of 70 to 80% of rated. So you're actually running at really low speed. You do a positive, uh, a negative frequency event, which means you have to inject power. So that power has to come from the drivetrain. It has to come from the rotating mass. And as you extract power from the rotating mass, your speed drops. If you are not curtailed, you don't have anywhere else to get speed. You just start extracting speed until you eventually trip on under speed. If you are curtailed, you might be able to extract more energy from the wind, depending on how fast your uh, pitch blade reacts. But regardless, you will eventually run into a point in which you cannot contribute more power because you're either running to under speed or you run into the pitch, pitch blade limitations. And that are these two curves that are showing on the left side. Now, if we keep with a negative frequency event and we start increasing the power, we eventually, eventually reach this like plateau of maximum power where the wind speed and the rotational speed is high enough that you don't have to worry about the uh, machine going into underspeed mode. And then you start going into what are the capacity, power, or current limits of, of the turbine. So here you have as most inertia as you have, because let's say you're running a 70, 80% uh, initial power. Your speed is one per unit, 1.05 per unit. So that means you can inject the most amount of inertia. As you go up to rated power, even though your wind speed is very high, your current is also going to be very high. So at that point, that starts limiting how much active current you can inject. Let's go back to the other region. So now you are injecting a positive Rokoff, which means your, freak, uh, your power will go negative. If you are running at low speed and low power, and you extract or you like absorb more active power, then there's actually no issue with the speed. But then the machine will start motoring after a certain region. Like you're going to be asking more power to be absorbed based on the Rokoff event than the machine was um, injecting in the first place. So the power will go negative. You start entering motoring mode. And then you usually have a fixed motoring protection anywhere between 25 to 40%, depending on how you define your turbine. So that is why this line is, is uh, flat. This will be determined by what is your motoring limit. Eventually, you reach a point in which the maximum amount that your Rokoff uh, can absorb is smaller than your initial power. And then you start going back into overspeed region. So let's say you're running at 1.2, 1.3 per unit speed, which is, let's say, your rated power. You do a row off, you try to absorb 30% power, your turbine goes into overspeed, and then that's where you have to limit it. So that, that's a quick explanation of all four regions. We think this is uh, quite useful, quite important. And in some ways, I understand that maybe a lot of the people here hate hearing this idea of the inertia you're able to inject is going to depend on the time of day, your operating conditions, your control, how you're doing it. You want to have a number five, three, four. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, it's not that simple. And even though we can draw some lines and say this, this much or this much, re regardless of where you draw the line, you're going to be either underestimating or overestimating the amount of inertia you're going to have for that given operating condition. Uh, this slide I was going to remove, but I, I'm, I'm thankful I didn't because it fits really well into what Jing was presenting earlier. Uh, on the right, we have uh, a small signal representation of the change in energy of over the change in angle. And in this case, it's not a wind turbine. It's just like a generic IBR. But uh, let, let me break down a little into what we're doing. On blue here, we're showing you how much energy you can contribute if you have a perfect voltage source behind the reactants. In uh, this, let's say, gray solid line, we have a representation. In this case, it's the best of how much energy you can contribute 
uh, doing the same task. You change the angle and then you measure how much energy you can contribute. Uh, as we were looking into it and thinking of what this all means, we started coming up that there's two limitations to how much energy you, you can contribute. Uh, Ying actually like developed a lot and spoke quite a bit on the first one, DC energy constraint devices. So I'm not going to go into that, but just refer to what she was saying. What we want to also highlight is there's another limitation, which is resonance constraint devices. These are devices in which the limitation is not how much energy you have in your DC bus, but it's what is the device doing in that frequency range. So in this case, we're thinking wind turbines and hydro will both have uh, resonance modes because of the, the mass of, of behind the, the converter or in front of the converter. So there's going to be a region, in this case, we're highlighting between one and let's say three hertz, in which the drivetrain vibrations are going to actually be fighting and countering how much power you can contribute in an inertial way. So we are thinking that it doesn't make much sense to try to request full inertial or energy contribution over the whole range when you have physical limitations that are there for real machines. Uh, we're trying to, this is still work in progress, but what we're thinking is that we can start creating like uh, exclusion zones. And outside those exclusion zones, we can demand full inertial contribution, full power contribution, but create those carve-outs. And maybe if we have enough different types of, of resources, those carve-outs will start not to overlap, but fall in different places. So as a whole, you will have a pretty smooth inertia. But to be able to get around these exclusion zones, the price of your devices would have to ex like go so high that we start worrying that it might become a uh, economic constraint. So let's just go back to the conclusions. Um, we didn't go into much details, but what we've seen before is that in general, the fold right through performance of grid forming wind is largely similar to grid falling wind. The performance in the fault is different, but which events it can ride through are mostly the same. Uh, this inertial contribution, we need to carefully define it. So this does not exclude equipment beneficial for the grid. If we say it has to be seven or five or three or four, and then someone runs a test in one of the edge cases that I show and said, oh, this turbine only has one, you can exclude that and then ignore all the other places where it's actually beneficial. And then finally, uh, mechanical limitations in addition to current limitations have to be considered or we run into the risk of making grid forming IBRs uh, overly expensive. Uh, so that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Ignacio. Um, if there's any question come up, I'll use presenters' rights or, or panel chair right to ask one quick question. Um, so in some of the slides that you had shown, and you also mentioned it was a state-of-the-art GFL, um, we've heard a lot about inertia-based fast frequency response techniques, especially for type three, that you can extract energy from the rotating machine from the blades and put that into the network. Um, is that enabled in these graphs here with the, with the resource? No, no, that's that's not enabled. We don't have that fast frequency response. And that, that usually requires uh, like a fast PLL and then that kind of creates a loop and we're trying to avoid that. So yes, it's, it's not included. Okay, yeah, Andrew. Hello, my name is Andrew Isaacs from Electronics. Uh, quick comment and then as many questions as you'll let me answer. So, or let me ask. The comment is your your choice of 500 milliseconds for inertial calculation is convenient because it lines up with when we're evaluating grid forming battery inertia. That's approximately when usually PPCs and other frequency secondary frequency controllers start to kick in and mess up that calculation. So that's good. It's lining up with other standard work right now. Question: You GEs in the past has presented um constraints on the mechanical system and you're touching on that in here mechanical limitations and you you know you got you guys have been very worried about that and how much energy you can draw out of the grid forming uh, controls because of those constraints when you're presenting this work and the, and the very nice inertia characteristic you're giving are you adding have you figured that out and are you now able to say, this is something we can do for kind of nominal cost, or is this still something extra that you're gonna to have to add to the equipment? It's the, the objective will be that the first generation of grid forming turbines will be at no additional cost, but to be able to pass all of the requirements that are out there, uh, we would probably do need like some sort of carve out for like these exclusion zones. 
and and that's mostly because we we cannot allow the um, the mechanical stress coupling torque etc to rise above a certain level so if let's say someone out there puts a one hertz perturbation 1.5 two hertz whatever like is the, the mode you will not see the power output that you expect and that would be like oh a fail right but it's not a fail it's because that power is being used to stabilize the mechanical system so it's, it's going to depend uh on what is the wording of of those devices but we think it's resolved as long as we get this 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 carve outs um additional technology let's say advanced uh, as in the way AMO divided core advanced uh might be possible with additional hardware and we might be able to get around these this carve outs but then that would increase the cost because we would have to have like additional hardware to, to get around that very good news so one more quick question oh no Deep <laughs> saying no. I'll talk to you afterwards. All right. Yeah. Thanks. And even to the others, to, to be fair to the last presenter, we do have to give time. So I would say come back after the last presenter and we can have a round. Um, so thanks, Ignacio. Um, our final presenter of the session will be Ulrich, who will be talking a little bit upon the protection of inverters. Yeah. Does this work? It should be on. Is it on? Brian? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thanks so much, Deepak, for organizing, and thanks, Isik, for inviting me and us for this session. Um, I'm really excited to bring control and optimization into power systems and make them more sustainable. And this is one of our recent works, actually, together with uh, several of collaborators. And I'm actually happy to see many of them actually here. So Deepak is part of our team. Andrew, who just asked a question, is part of the team. Not sure if Ken is still here from Hawaiian Electric. And I must admit, I forgot one of our partners because Aditya from Opel RT is actually also joined the team about three months ago. So uh, you see, it's a pretty large team. Um, it's actually not Unify in this case, but it's an RPE funded project that is focusing on protection of inverter dominated transmission systems. And when you think of transmission systems, I can probably go quickly over this first part slide. Transmission system, of course, pose many, many different challenges. And we all know this. This is what this all workshop is about. Uh, can you maybe show me with your hands who is actually looking into power system stability? Can you just raise your hands? I would say it's definitely more than 50% of the people here. Now raise your hands who looks into protection for inverter dominated systems. One, two, barely anyone. Andrew, three. <laughs> well, you're part of the team. <laughs> so this is what I'm going to talk about, right? How can we ensure protection for inverter dominated systems. And kind of as my little question at the beginning just showed is there's barely any work on protection for inverter dominated systems. And I'm happy to see even in this round, right, where we have a lot of people, expertise, experts in stability of inverter dominated systems, there's barely anything in protection. So what we did at the very beginning, almost two years ago, is to look into what, what is the state of the art? Right, again, thinking about 18 months back, we looked at the available literature with the whole team, so Deepak was part of it, other folks from EPRI, from Sandia, of course from Siemens as well. We conducted interviews with more than 20 experts to understand where are we as a community and what are the, the knowns and the unknowns, right? And the challenges I'm listing here is we have sometimes, we see non-sinusoidal currents coming out of the inverters. We have seen examples now where it looks nicer Right, um, but this is the examples that we got from consultants who worked on projects in the field. And I said, I've seen measurements with non-sinusoidal currents coming out of the inverters. I hope, of course, inverters are getting better and maybe today we won't see this anymore, but this is things that we have seen in the past. Oscillations after the fault are cleared is a topic we will visit actually later in my presentation. The big of challenge is vendor proprietary um, inverters functions that, that you can actually in the simulation models. I mean, Waidu has shown a nice example about generic models, right? But these are positive sequence models. So we have to look into unbalanced faults. We have to look in all these nasty things and go into EMT simulations. And the first takeaway that I want you to take from this presentation is that this is a wide spot in the research community. We're not the only one working on this. I mean, we have seen already presentation. Unify, of course, has looked into this. Not sure if Guohi is here from the Solar Energy Technology Office. They had a call a year ago or so. So there's more teams now looking into this. I'm really happy to see that we are not the only ones who see this as a relevant topic and there are more people joining forces in order to drive this very important topic. Yeah. So what we are doing in this project I'm presenting here, I'm just presenting a small portion of it, 
is to look what I call protection inverter co-design. So when you think of protection for inverter dominated systems, you have to look at both the inverters and the protection devices and understand how they work together. The inverters have to provide the currents that the protection devices need to identify where the fault is and to open quickly and reliably, right? So what we see on this, this point of working, yeah. So what you see here, uh, we look at the fault right through functions of the inverters. I will talk about this a bit later. We're looking at the protection functions for the relays. Um, then on the right-hand side, I won't talk about this today, but we have developed a co-simulation tool between PSCAT and PSSCAPE. PSCAT has been mentioned many times already here at this workshop, of course, most people know it. PSSCAPE is a tool for computer-added protection engineering. So traditionally, if you do protection design, many people in the US use PSSCAPE. The point is, it's of course not an EMT tool, but it's actually a phaser tool. It's not even RMS, so it's really phaser steady state kind of calculations, right? And we said, well, if we want to analyze this, we need to couple an EMT tool like PSCAT with a protection engine tool like CAPE. And then also we do an optimization to find what is the best setting, both of the inverters and the protection devices to actually achieve good protection and reliable protection in your system. Um, and then we build different test beds here. Today, I will mostly talking about the simulation model that you see here on the lower left, kind of very simple model, and it somewhat resembles the system of Hawaii of Big Island, which is the one that we will do at the very end of the project. So I won't talk much about this today. And uh, there's also an interesting step here where we build a hardware test bed, different from what Jing presented, not with commercial inverters, but we have very flexible inverters, so we can actually try out different FRT functions and how the system responds to that. So today I will be talking mostly about the simulation results and the FRT and the protection functions. Let me start with fault right through for grid forming inverters. We have already seen one or the other slide related to this. Um, I try to keep it very simple. I have very detailed slides if you want to discuss this uh, later on. But we consider two kind of um, grid forming controllers. So we have on the one hand a cascaded voltage and current controllers. Um, and then we have intermediate locations where you can limit the current. One is here just in front of the current controller, you have a current limit, or a topic that also was brought up in one of the earlier presentations, I think by you, do is about virtual inertia. So basically reducing the voltage at the, before you actually run it through your control loops so that the current that comes out of the inverter um, is below the limit that you have. Uh, the other grid forming control structure we are looking at is the direct voltage controller. So there is actually no current controller and then obviously you cannot do current limiting directly, but you can use virtual inertia or virtual resistance to couple this, right? And then you get end up with, if you look at all the different combinations, we have four different fault right through functions that we are looking at. Now, how do we analyze the protection reliability in simulation? We started with this fairly simple model. Yeah, you, you will see how complex already this very simple model is if you look at the complexities that it covers. As I said before, it somehow resembles the system on Big Island where you have one big transmission line around the system, around the island, and then was east-west connection. So it's kind of a very, very simplified version of that system. And we asked the question, if there are faults on these five lines that you see here, are the correct relays opening the fault and fast enough and not the wrong, and not taking out basically incorrect lines there where there is no fault. So looking at this, I showed you on the previous slide, there are different fault right through functions. So we have four different options, how we equip the inverters. Actually, I forgot one detail. They are grid forming and grid following inverters. So I'm focusing here only on the fault right through functions for the grid forming inverters. For grid following, it's a standard basically from the, from the grid codes implementation of the fault right through behavior. Then we look at different faults. I mentioned already earlier that it's not only balanced faults, but we have single line to ground, line to line, two line to ground, and then three line to ground faults. The faults can be at either end of the line or in the center of the line, so you get even more combinatorial complexity. And then we look at four different protection functions, which is overcurrent, distance protection, permissive overreach transfer trip and differential protection, right? And if you basically sum this all up, you come up with a table. This is a very, very simplified version of the table. I show you more details later, but this is kind of, which is the good FRT function, which is a good protection function for the different kinds of faults and false locations, right? And I'm not even talking about different dispatch modes or if we put a synchronous generator here or there, 
Um, we are not going into that space um, because it just even more increases the complexity of, of analyzing the system. Um, if you sum this up, we are almost at 1,000 simulations if you run all those cases. So this is just one example of uh, one of these simulations that you can see. You see here the PS cut model uh, that the team has built up. And then you see here the fault behavior of the system. You see in this case, the relay is tripping correctly. I'm not sure if you can read the, uh, the y-axis. If you're getting confused, this is actually measurements of the secondary side of the relays. So that's why this is not per unit or anything, um, but it kind of, um, if you translate it into per unit, it kind of shows us that the currents are probably limited in this case. And also what you can see here in the plot down here, this is kind of a fake. This is not one simulation, but it's actually four simulations in one. So we can compare how the different protection relays would respond in this one case. Yeah. Um, and that's actually what I want to take you into for the next slide, because this is the first what I found quite interesting finding. Yeah. So again, this is both sides of the slide is 16 simulations. So on the left-hand side, you see four different uh, fault right through, one, two, three, four. And then what you see in these lines is when the different protection relays actually respond in this specific case, this is a one fault, a single line to ground, midline fault. This is very important, right? So it's the middle of the line, which leads to, for all these four protection relays, not sure if you can read it here, but the the response, the clearing time is about 60 milliseconds, right? So for all FRTs, for all protection relays, it's about the same behavior. Now, if you go to an end line fault, and those of you familiar with protections, then of course, for distance protection, you go into zone two. That's why it takes longer. So you end up with somewhere between 60 and 150 milliseconds fault clearing time. And also interesting to note that in this case here, there is actually overcurrent, which is actually not clearing the fault at all in this case. Uh, so you see already the complexity of, okay, there are many different cases. Sometimes they behave one way, sometimes the other, and we need to analyze this. So what we came up with is a metric to analyze a large, large number of simulations and data sets. So we have defined these KPIs based on IEEE standards and power system relaying committees. And um, you can see them here. I won't go through them really in detail, but important is like dependability means fault is actually cleared. Yeah. Security means that you have no uh, misoperation of the relay, so they are only opening when they're supposed to be opening. Selectivity is, of course, that the correct relay is opening. And then fast uh, fault clearance, what Hawaiian Electric told us, they expect that the faults are cleared within five cycles. But this, as you will see later, is sometimes uh, quite a challenge. And last but not least, system stability. That's actually the most tricky one, as you will see on the next slides. So fault uh, system stability means on the one hand, once the fault is cleared, you want the system to go back into stable operation. But also, if there is not a fault, if you have a large load event, if you have maybe a generator loss or something, um, you want the system to not create any, any issues because of the fault right through functions or because the relay is opening when they're not supposed to open. And then we summarize all of this. So again, we are about 1,200 simulations after all, just for this simple case example. And then I will summarize this in certain numbers that you will see now on the next slides in these tables. And to simplify the understanding, so don't read the numbers, of course, I, I, we use color coding to give you the main, main messages. Yeah? So when you compare, first thing that you see here, this is analyzing are the faults cleared by the correct relays? Yeah, this, is, this is fault cases. And we see that in most cases, these two blocks, the first one, this is fault right through one, two, three, and four. And then in the second, second column, you see the different protection relay functions. And what is um, good to know that they look pretty similar. So irrespective of which FRT function you're using, you're more or less getting a similar behavior on this abstraction level, right? And then you see also that Line current differential and PO2T are all green. So this looks like, yes, this is the protection relay of choice. Um, obviously, they are also pretty expensive because they re require communication, right? Line differential is real-time communication. Uh, Misses overreaching transfer trip. Well, maybe not as fast communication, but also requires communication between both sides of the line. Yeah. Um, distance is an interesting candidate. You see here, midline faults are cleared quite well. 
Whereas end line falls, once they are in zone two of distance protection, this is when we are running into too slow uh, fault clearance. Um, and that's of course something we need to address, um, for example, by fall, faster clearing times, uh, by faster relays, et cetera. And then overcurrent protection is all red, so that's something that we want to avoid. Now looking into the stability issues of the system, first post fault stability. So we have a fault, the fault is cleared, system comes back and you wanna ensure that the system is stable and reaches a good operation mode afterwards. So we have on the one hand, left hand side of this table, you see the voltage stability, right hand side is the power stability. And again, you see a lot of these boxes are red, which means that they are not reaching the, the performance metrics that we've defined before. Yeah. And the question is, of course, what can we do here? And actually one way to resolve this, and also that was discussed earlier, is what is the IMAX of the inverter? So we assume here on the left-hand side, the IMAX is 1.2 per unit. We already heard that Hawaiian Electric has a target or has the requirement of 1.6 per unit. Cannot tell you how many discussions I had over the last months of what is the right per unit. <laughs> Please don't ask me because I don't know. but. Um, there are many people have very different opinions about what is realistic up to, I think someone had Tesla says 2.0 is no problem. So, um, but just increasing it by a little bit already has a big impact here, right? So this is still one direction that we continue to investigate. What is really the impact is 10% more headroom making such a big change. Yeah? Now, the other part of system stability is when we look in non-fault cases. So again, this is load steps generator outages and similar cases. So you actually don't want your FRT to operate and you don't want your protection layers to open any lines. But this is actually what is happening sometimes. And especially what you see here in this all red block in the center, this is the rate of change of frequencies. So in this case, we have admittedly pretty large load steps and large generator losses. So this is a pretty heavy um, impact on the system. You probably wouldn't see this at let's say the West End interconnection, but of course Hawaii is a smaller island and there a larger load step uh, or loss of generator is actually not that unlikely. Um, in my past project with Hawaiian Electric, we looked into N minus one security and one of the cases they are looking into is loss of 50% of the DRs. So you have all these rooftop systems and there could be an event when you lose 50% of those DRs and um, you still want to maintain system stability, which means of course a big, whatever, 20, 30% uh, loss of your generation, right? So it's not that unrealistic. Um, and again, the question here comes up, what is the solution? What can we do in order to um, achieve better performance? Of course, we can reduce the size of the load and generation steps. We can fine tune the fault right through functions. Uh, we can require again, the inverters to provide higher fault functions in, or, or admit higher fault fu functions. And of course, we could add also additional stabilization measures. Uh, what you see, have seen maybe at the earlier slides, we use so far only droop controls. And as we've seen by way two in the presentation is that you can do virtual inertia or other um, algorithms or control loops into the inverters, which probably would help with this. Um, and this is all ongoing work. So we will see how far this takes us. Uh, with this, I would like to summarize the presentation. So what is it that you should remember? First thing, and I really hope you remember this, this is an open field. Uh, there is more activity going on, but I think there still needs more work to be done. The results that we show so far, I'm always very cautious, right? Because this is a simple model. It's a simple case. Uh, we try to extensively analyze this one case. Um, and we see that so far standard protection, standard protection functions work actually pretty well. The biggest issue that we see is with the post fault stability and um, yeah, ensuring both after the fault is cleared, but also non-fault cases that the system is stable. Uh, the outlook, I think, is that we mostly fo will focus then also showing the results for the hardware testbed. So as you can see here, the hardware testbed is resembling the kind of the same structure that you see here. Um, the first tests have already been conducted by EPRI actually, and, and Deepak is heavily working on this <laughs> to get this all up and running. And maybe then in a year or so, we can show you also the results from the hardware testbed. And maybe last but not least, this is a testbed. So this is all small systems. What we want to do towards, let's say next summer is to have a real-time simulation of the, well, not the real system, but like the system that Hawaii uses today to analyze their system. So you have many, many more details in this system uh, from Hawaii Big Island. 
um, and run this in Opal RT and then connect it to real C protect protection relays. So basically you're simulating the system, you run it through a protection relay and then see how this, this system responds. I call this protection hardware in the loop testbed. So this will show if we take it from small simulation and hardware testbed to a realistic size, well, still small, but realistic size transmission system, are there any changes or are these statements that we make still valid? With this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and maybe a few questions